I'm Christine Jones. I created Theatre for One in 2002 and am the artistic director, co-artistic director, and um, maker of Theatre for One with all the wonderful artists we work with. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jenny Coons. I am co-artistic director of this season of Here We Are, Theatre for One. Um, and I guess, Christine, we started collaborating together a few years ago um, on an in-person iteration of this, also with Arts Brookfield. Um, and have been a fan and was a fan beforehand as well. So excited to be part of this season. Uh, I'm Mark Downey. I'm a new media artist, experimental filmmaker. Uh, I make art on and with computers. I joined this project because a curator uh, arranged this marriage and uh, said that we should, um, we should get together. I also work with Paul Kaiser. Uh, my name is Paul Kaiser. I'm the other half of the open-ended group with Mark Downey. Uh, by background, I'm an experimental filmmaker, uh, then a uh, new media artist and multimedia artist and also writer. Been working with uh, Mark for 19 years now, I believe, and we've been working in the areas of performance as well as installation and public art and so on. So Theatre for One began, as I mentioned, in 2002 as a physical um, theater. It's a, it's a portable private performing art space for one actor and one audience member. And we started making work at New York Theater Workshop in a workshop setting. And then over the years have developed the piece at the O'Neill, at Princeton University, with Juilliard, and eventually began performing for the public in 2011 in Times Square and since then have collaborated with uh, different institutions, including Arts Brookfield, to create residencies in locations around Manhattan and, uh, and other places like Ireland, where we performed in a theater festival last summer. So we've been making work on and off for the last 18 years. And when the pandemic struck and lockdown began, we were in the process of planning for a summer residency at Arts Brookfield and Elisa approached us and asked us if we would want to consider moving online. So at that moment, I called Jenny Coons and we started brainstorming. And together we came up with the, the idea for what Here We Are could be. And I'll let Jenny speak to, to how we developed the programming from there. Sure, so one of my favorite memories when Christine and we started talking about it was you know, exploring this digital space as a new form, as a new form of theater, that it's not just a translation of, well, we did this before, so how does that merge? But actually imagining this space, kind of as you did in the booth, in real life booth, as, um, as meaningful, as thoughtfully designed and intentional as that space is when an audience member goes in. And so we made a list of kind of our favorite emotions or what people feel when they're in the booth, what people feel when they're waiting in line to see a show that they um, will experience. And some of those elements of surprise or intimacy or one-on-one -on -one eye contact and connection, that kind of short list, which really reflected the values of theater for one became kind of like a code of how we wanted to move forward. And I remember when we started, we, we were like, okay, so if you bend the camera, if you do the frame, and we were making paper cutouts for our webcams and um, going under blankets in front of our computers and thinking about how to create some of those tenants. And the thing that we kept saying and that you kept saying was that the eye contact and the feeling of an intentional space in Zoom just didn't quite feel right. Um, even with those interventions, even with those modifications. And that's when kind of serendipity intervened and we were connected with um, Mark and Paul. Um, and I'm curious if you both would talk a little bit, because it felt kind of like a convergence that you also were asking some of those questions in your digital work as a result of those 19 years. And it felt kind of wild that we were brought together in this moment. And I want to jump in for one second and say that Mark and I actually met at a, an after party for a poetry reading in Chicago um, about six months before. So we had actually had a conversation 
And then when Mara, um, Mara Isaacs, our octopus theatricals producer, when she and I were having a conversation with a curator in Chicago who had expressed interest in the project, we were talking about how, but we're, we're trying to find the type of people that could help us solve the eye contact question. And she said, I have somebody in mind for you. And an open-ended group is who you should talk to. And immediately I started wondering, wait a minute, there was some really interesting artist I spoke to at a party. Is there any chance it could be that person? Uh, and cut to uh, Paul and Mark being contacted by Sarah to connect us together. You, you were the only person I remember from that party. Um, I, I knew you'd be important. Um, from our perspective, I mean, if you look at the work that Paul and I have done over the last 19 years, um, we're not a very good fit for this project at all. Uh, we're, we don't do things online. Um, uh, we don't generally do interactive things. Um, we are used to, and we've been privileged to be in really well-controlled, well-configured, um, expensive spaces with our own hardware and kind of sort of complete control over all aspects of the experience. Um, and this is in some sense the opposite of that. Um, it's, it's live, it's interactive, it's on other people's computers. Um, there's a, not a lot of control um, over the technical platform or, or what happens. Um, there's not a lot of feedback, these dialogues between performance and audience is going on and we can't really see what's going, uh, what's taking place. Um, but one thing that we have been able to do on one sort of through line through all of our work is that we've used technology to bring people really close to performances. Um, and often that's been uh, dancers and choreographers. We've been able to put a performance under a microscope um, and give people really privileged seats uh, in front of a dance or a mini opera or something. Um, so that's sort of what we were eventually you know, striving to do uh, here. And the sort of the need just to be able to figure out what, you know, what role can we play in this moment, um, that, that for us has become the answer. So yeah, I, I think that uh, for us, we've had this uh, interesting um, intersection with performance over the years. Uh, and we've always been interested in seeing it from ways you can't perceive it from your normal theater seat. So I only figured out this morning that another interesting overlap in this project is with uh, Brookley, Brookfield Place, because the very first project I did in um, performance was with Merce Cunningham, it was a collaboration with Merce Cunningham and my then collaborator, Merce, uh, Shelley Eshkar. And uh, it was uh, per performed then or presented then in a large three screen projection. And then, uh, I, don't know, I can't remember how much later, but in the 2000s, uh, Harvest Works applied, which helped produce it, applied to the NEA to get it granted some sort of masterwork thing. And they gave us money to update it to its current form. And we presented that at Brookfield Place. And I only just put two and two together to get that. And, and that was a kind of piece where, again, we were looking at not only the dance, but also Merce's choreography in a way that you could never possibly see uh, on the stage. And the other thing that, that um, came to us in working with dance so closely was that we so often got to see uh, in the rehearsals, the dancers from much closer up and from much different angle, many different angles. So when you approached us, we thought that this was the perfect fit for the kind of intimacy that we aim for in, in our own work even though it was so different. You know, we don't normally do like ordinary video, for example, but it was a great fit. So. Our connection with Arts Brookfield began in 2015 when we were invited to create a body of work for a residency, which we entitled Theater for One, I'm Not the Stranger You Think I Am. And we commissioned six writers to make six new pieces. We performed work with Arts Brookfield at several Brookfield property locations, both at the, at the Winter Garden, Zuccotti Park, and Grace Plaza. And then when they moved online, uh, when the lock 
lockdown happened, we were invited by them to, um, to create work for their new online platform. So this is a collaboration that's been happening for a few years and it's extraordinary to have been given an opportunity at this time to support artists, to engage artists, to engage artistically with uh, such a range of artists in addition to working with Open Ended Group, which is a new collaboration. All of the directors, writers, and actors were people that for the most part were performing with us for the first time. So it's been an incredible moment to create a sense of community despite the social distancing and despite all of the limitations that we are, we're faced to confront right now. The challenge here is to produce something where the technology evaporates, right? Uh, where the, the technology just dis disappears, it's transparent. Um, if you don't see it, you don't feel it. It's not about the technology. It's not commenting on the technology. It's gone. And what you are is you're in front of another human being. Um, without mediation, without latency, without noise, without um, any of the things that um, is happening right now, um, that we've been experiencing in quarantine, all of that has been stripped away. So that kind of transparency is what I've been aiming for, you know, both in an engineering uh, sense, but also in an artistic sense. Uh, when that has gone, um, then there's a connection there that's really powerful and unexpected um, and difficult. So that's what success in this venue um, looks like for me. Um, I've never been so pleased to sort of read reviews where no one has said anything about the technology. Um, Half of the experience is not one-to-one. -one. It's what we call the, the waiting room. And one of our major um, emphases was to make that very distinct from the experience of this face-to-face -face with the actor. And the waiting room is in the fact a kind of chat room, although I detest that name. And the different, there are huge differences between the two aspects of your experience because you come into the waiting room not knowing who's there, not having any other faces. It's silent, all you get are text. And the texts don't appear in the usual um, consecutive scrolling pattern, but they appear anywhere in the screen with this sort of beautiful glow and so on. And probably for me, the most exciting proof of the, of the value of this was I think maybe the very first, maybe first or second time we tried it out amongst ourselves, when all of a sudden there sprang up this kind of collective uh, merging of thinking that I'd never experienced before. And since that's what we're after in this whole program is to try to find new expression that we done, even in this limited age, where we're doing everything through a screen, that, that to me was, was the key moment for me. Yeah, I, I think about um, the phrase, here we are. And as Christine mentioned, like each of the seasons, each of the residencies has kind of a starting phrase that is what we give to the writers as a starting point. I'm not the stranger you think I am um, in this moment and then this season, here we are. And something you said before, Mark, about how this feels like a different kind of turn in the road for open-ended group from the 19 years up to this point. And I, I think about uh, how a number of writers said that when we would talk about what this experience was. I, uh, you know, Christine, I think you and I have been hesitant in the past about entering this digital space. And I know, as you've mentioned, many people have said for a long time, theater for one could be more accessible if you did it online. Or what if multiple people watched one performance at once? And and kind of going back to this one-to-one -one intimacy, this, this immediacy. Um, I think, Paul, when you were talking about the moment when you're on, on the experience and you go from the chat into seeing an image of yourself, and then that image blends into the performer. And just how to frame this, this space for where we are and an in, and a, a meaningful engagement with a stranger in this moment of extreme isolation. Um, 
And I had, I had mentioned, I think, in an early meeting, someone commented to me a few months ago that it was so nice to be in a Zoom with strangers because she had felt like in this moment as each month goes on, our bubble really is our bubble of people we know and meetings we hold. And, and so experiencing here we are with someone you don't know and being responsible for that intimacy for three minutes, six minutes, feels like it brings up so many questions also about what's next, which feels exciting to me. Um, and I'm excited for more people to experience that not knowing in this as we extend into October. Well, yeah, to speak to the waiting room, one of the things that we wanted to bring from what it's like to do theater for one in person was the community that is created while people are waiting in line. And there's this sense that you're in an environment, be it Brookfield Place or Grace Plaza, and you're in line with people sometimes for an hour, sometimes two hours. And you might be in line with somebody that you've never met. And often people became engaged in conversations and made real connections with those, those people in the line with them. So we were trying to think about how we could bring that quality of the communal feeling outside of the booth that happens before you enter into the booth into this virtual platform and this experience. And so we entered into conversations with Mark and Paul and how we could do this and, and the, the beauty with which they articulated that idea, the way that the words fade up and fade out. And I think one of my favorite moments was when um, somebody pressed the asterisk key and then everybody else started pressing the asterisk key and suddenly we were watching a snowfall or a rainfall or stars, stars glistening in this dark sky. And we felt transported as a group that is anonymous, but without sounding too corny, it does feel like people are speaking soul to soul. And it feels like being in an infinite space, in space and alone, but together in a profound way. And I think the moment, as Paul said, it was maybe the first or the second time we tried it out, it was like something coming to life. Like, I, I keep thinking about, um, about Frankenstein or about um, NASA astronauts, that there's a moment where something blasts off, but there's a moment where the scientist extracts the life force and puts it into something and it comes alive. There was a moment when the waiting room came alive and, and I think we were all delighted to discover that something we all had an idea about making came to be in a way that was what we hoped for, but also more than what we hoped for, larger than us in some way. So that the ripple of that moment has continued. I feel like that feeling is just rippling into the rest of the work and the project and, and, and the fact that we're able to extend with Brookfield's support is, is incredible. So that ripple feels like it's still, it's still emanating. So one way to look at the, the, the technical challenges we had building, um, building our own platform and you know, everything about this is running on our own servers with our own code. Um, I'm actually realized a while ago that what I was trying to do is try to get back to the internet that I had and the relationship I had to the internet that I had uh, in the mid nineties, right? Which seems like a strange ambition um, because 25 years have passed, everything's supposed to be uh, better, faster and whizzier. But back in the mid nineties, the internet that I was promised in a sense was um, often anonymous. Um, it was a space of performance. I could pretend to be anyone I wanted to be. Um, I could pretend to be somebody different next week. Um, and there's a lot of that in the chat room uh, in its anonymity. And it was symmetric. So there was a sense that I was welcomed into the internet as an equal participant. So I could send video as quickly as I could receive it. Um, and 
we've lost all of that. Um, and, or rather, we've, we've lost it quite quickly, and then quarantine happens, lockdown happens, and then we suddenly discover that we've lost it again. Uh, we realize that this infrastructural inequity is just being sort of baked in um, in front of us. And we've all got internet, even when it's good. Uh, the internet has been structured for us where it's really convenient for us to watch Netflix, um, but it's actually really hard for us to send video back out into the world. And we're dependent on a handful of tools. We're, we've become dependent on Zoom, for example. Um, we don't quite have the necessary bandwidth um, or the platform to do those kinds of things. So suddenly we, we have to invent um, all of that kind of from scratch. And um, sort of demanding that, that that was possible and making it possible um, and saying, no, this is going to run on our uh, hardware. This is going to, we're going to have crossfades. We're going to make it seamless. Uh, we're going to sort of be able to craft the stages of experience, uh, that's been really important. Um, I feel like we've, we've claimed um, some ground back uh, uh, from the forces that have shaped our relationship to computers and each other right now. Um, so that's, that's a, a more poetic way of describing some of the technical challenges um, that we faced. One other thing to say is that we wanted to provide a theater for one uh, experience where you don't have it framed by a major corporation. It's not that you're doing it in Facebook Live or you aren't doing it through Google or you aren't doing it through all the you know, other things where you always have this sense that around your experience are all these other ones that have nothing to do with it that are in fact beckoning you to leave your current experience and go, go away. Whereas here we wanted you to go and focus for a change on one thing. So that I think was a key thing that Mark accomplished in creating this platform was being able to make it as an actual um, destination that was purely artistic. There's no commercial aspect to it, even in its framing. So. Well, and one thing I'd love to add to that too about the process of this that was so unique is that we did a number of demo, demo sessions leading up to even first rehearsal with um, people that were on it for the first time with some test actors who were reading poems or monologues to see what the, what things, what each turn of the experience felt like. And then we would all come together and talk about it and make adjustments and then try it again. And that was a process that the writers and directors were also able to come into very early on, which is also very unique. It's not just like, okay, you know Zoom, you're making it for Zoom, waiting room, mute, all of that. But to be all crafting this thing together and to have collaborators who are also working on crafting that as, as thoughtfully as the monologues, as each rehearsal, that was such an unusual and beautiful part of the process. Yeah, I wanna echo that and say that I think of this as a venue and it felt like we were building the theater while we were writing the plays, while we were rehearsing, and that it was all happening simultaneously. And I've, I've been saying that our computers have become our prosceniums and our screens have become the fourth wall that we are trying to break through. And it feels like a container, like a vessel like a space that we come to for this particular engagement. And I think that's also the beauty of what Mark and Paul have done is that it has its own, it, it's its own space. It's not a space that, that other institutions or iterations of theater or film or video are using. It's, it's specifically built for theater for one in the same way that our physical booth is an architectural space designed specifically for that type of engagement. And so the care with which every detail was considered from the color, the font, the timing, it, it was building a theater, but, but, but as, as Mark just said, but like a poetic version of what a theater space can be. So it's, it's, it's been a beautiful manifestation of many different ideas and intentions, but the heart of connection and, and proximity and intimacy that I think both open-ended group and Theater for One have been interested in manifesting 
feels like we were able to bring those missions into this platform. There's a fairly elaborate sort of backstage area, um, which uh, we've built, which are a set of web pages for uh, us to stare at, which are completely behind the scenes. Um, and early on, we started calling that air traffic control. Um, and there are a number of people who have an air traffic control um, role. Um, and I have spent the last four performances essentially just staring at screenfuls of, of, of numbers and air traffic control, uh, nervously making sure that nothing falls apart. Um, I don't think I've pushed any buttons in any of the last four performances, um, maybe one or two. Um, but I'm just even now still learning things about how, uh, how people's computers connect to other people's computers when they're suddenly asked to do uh, video, for example. Um, so there are lots of numbers, there are lots of statistics that we've been um, gathering. Uh, there are lots of files uh, being produced. But behind the scenes, there's definitely um, a stage manager role, a uh, person who's going to agree with the actors that um, they're ready to receive someone, uh, to make that connection, to push the button on that, pluck someone out of the chat room um, and put them face to face with a uh, uh, performer. Um, there's uh, technical support if people uh, can't um, make it through the experience. There's a testing page where you test to see if your camera or microphone works. Uh, sometimes people get hung up on that. Um, and uh, there are moderators in chat um, to keep chat going, sort of guide that and uh, uh, in inject bits of language um, into that space. Uh, there's another moderation page uh, for the guest book at the end just to make sure that um, everything is fine, um, fine there. Uh, and we're all looking at pages which either look very similar to the, the pages that the audience get um, or contain screenfuls of uh, numbers of statistics. How long have people been waiting in chat? Um, how long has this performance been going on with an actor? So if, if an actor seems to have given 15 minute long performance, maybe something's gone wrong. Maybe their computer's crashed. Uh, maybe their audience's computer's crashed, uh, something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a big complicated system behind it that has multiple views onto it, uh, depending on, on the role that that person uh, plays. So we, we uh, chose uh, a dark background mainly because Mark and I always do. All, in many of our works, in any case. And what is great about the darkness you enter is it seems much, much bigger than a white window would seem, the typical one. And you can almost read depth into it. So for example, uh, in the moment that Christina was describing when people created the uh, stars or snowflakes, it felt vast as opposed to contained. And then as for silence, um, you know, it was, uh, a way to focus more, focus yourself more. And people regard that space as both uh, a meditative space and a, and a space to communicate with others. And as Christine, Christina said, it, was, it is a little bit like soul to soul because, or ghost to ghost even, and, um, or spirit to spirit, maybe that's the best way. Uh, and that was what we were trying to evoke, I think. And also the, the idea that these, uh, that your comments would appear anywhere in the screen also made the space mean, feel big. That was, I think that was the main thing we were after, this, this larger mystery that felt, you know, you know almost like this the starry sky or something like this, some vast space. Yeah, and I think, I think it would almost be more apt to call it the preparation space because part of the idea was also that the audience member, just like the performer, is preparing for what's going to take place. And I, I like to call the audience member the audience sir, because I feel like in this realm, the audience er and the performer are both equally active and engaged in the experience. And in the waiting room, it's an opportunity for the audience member to slow down, leave 
some of their day behind them, literally get in touch with their breathing and, and be in this dark space so that their eyes get a rest, their ears get a rest, and they are preparing to be engaged with the actor. So, um, so it, it, was, it was really out of, out of what we could do to prepare the audience for the, for the experience. And also Theatre for One has always been a black and white, uh, black, white, and red is the palette of Theatre for One in terms of our graphics and the booth itself. So we wanted to bring some of that, that quality forward as well. We had planned for um, the Thursdays in September and have been met with pretty overwhelming response and enthusiastic response to the dates. And so we have been invited, um, thanks to Arts Brookfield, to extend and, and go through the Thursday evenings in October, which is a great opportunity to just give more chances for people to sign up and uh, join us for a performance. I think my advice for someone who's on the fence about coming would be uh, just do it and turn off your phone and find a quiet space and put on some headphones and come as you are, whether that's you just got off eight hours of Zoom and you feel like you can't possibly get onto your laptop again, or whether you're dying for a live performance again and just deeply miss what that feels like. Uh, don't be scared. Patience, purpose, and live. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would encourage, I would say that um, there are lots of forces, commercial forces, infrastructural forces that try to make this really hard, um, but it'll be worth it. Um, and that, that uh, this is what people need. Uh, there's, there's a real sort of hunger for this kind of connection. There's a need for theater. Uh, there's a need to know that theater uh, is still alive in this moment. Um, and people are responding to that. Um, we're responding to that. Um, that uh, all of this is, is uh, exactly what we should be doing right now. Uh, and we really want to say thank you to Brookfield Place for including us in your digital programming and giving us a place to make work, whether it's virtual or in person, Arts Brookfield has been an incredible supporter of our work.